Wehi, te mana te taku, ko te ki kei runga taupoki ngi atu ki te pū ki te wānanga, ki a tātou e hui nei. Ka tau ko te tangikura ki a hākinaake ki te iwi nui, ki a tau ki runga ki a tātou, tēnei te nihi nihi, tēnei te naha naha, tūturo o whiti ki a whakamaua ki a tīna. Haumi e, hui e, tāe ki e. E te māngai o te whare tēnei, taku mihi tuatahi ki a koe. Nau nei i haka puaretea tō tātou huhunga i rongi ngā kupu karakia. Nau nei i hono tia te rangi ki te whenua, te whenua ki te rangi nā reira tēnā rā koe. Tēnā rā hoki koe, nau nei nā te kāwana tia nā rā i haka manahia tō tūranga, nā reira e mihi kauana ki a koe mō tēnā tūranga. E tika ana ki a huri tātou ki te wāhi ngaro o tātou tini mate, Ngā mate, nā tātou katoa i pikau ngia ki rotu tēnei whare. Haere ngā mate, haere. Ko tōku hoa, a Rudy Taylor, tētahi i tērā wiki ko tukuna atu ki te kōpu o te whenua. Nā reira, Rudy, me te tini, te mano e takotoana kei rongi ngā marae maha potano i te motu. Haere ngā mate, haere, haere, haere a tira. Engari, rātou ki a rātou, te hunga wairua ko hoki mai ki a tātou ngā kānuhi ora. Me ngā kaupapa kei mui a tātou. Nā tuatahi māko e mihi at kau atu ki te premier, tēnā rā koe e te Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern, kaurua ko the Honourable Grant Robertson, te premier me te premier tuorua, kua kōrero te motu, nā rātou i whakatau, ko kaurua ngā kai whakahare o te motu, o te kāwanatanga, nā reira mihi kauna ki a kaurua. Ka whakawhiti atu a hau ki te hapitihanga, ki te tūmuaki o te rōpu nahinara, the Honourable Judith Collins, tēnā rā koe, me tō kāhui mema e tautoko ngi āna ki a koe. E te tuakana e Shane, mihi kauna ki a koe, nau nei whiwhinia te tūmuaki tuarua o te pāti nahinara, ko whakamanahia e koe o iwi, o tō hapu, o te kapotai, o Ngāti Wai. Nā reira, tēnā rā koe mō tēnā tūranga. Ka huri atu ki oku whanaunga, kei rote te Pāti Māori e Rāwari, tēnā rā koe e te tuahine debi, tēnā rā kaurua. Ko kōrero hoki te tao Māori, kei konei kaurua, hei hāpai, hei akiaki ai i ngā kaupapa Māori o te motu. Ko koutou, ko mātou hoki e kawana tēnā kaupapa, nā reira tēnā rā kaurua. Kia koe e te tūmuaki o te Rōpu Act, David Seymour, Tēnā rā koe, kua pua wai tō pāti, tō rōpu, nā reira i mihi kauna ki a koe, mahara ki a hau, i mua ake, nā une i mea mai ki a hau, tō tino hia hia, ki a tupu ake tō pāti, nā une i whakatinana hia taua moi moi a nō, nā reira tēnā rā koe. E te hoa, the Honourable James Shaw, me te tuahene Honourable Marama Davidson, tēnā rā kaurua, ngā kai arahi o te rōpu kākariki, kua pua wai hoki tō rōpu, tō kaurua rōpu, nā reira mihi kauna ki a koutou. Me ngā mihi hoki ki ngā minita o mua, Honourable Eugenie Sage, Honourable Julian Genta, tēnā rā kaurua mō ngā mahi nā kaurua i mahingia i te pāremata o mua. Nā reira ngā mema hau huriraina tēnā koutou, ki tō mātou pāti o te rōpu reipa, tēnā rā koutou ngā mema hau. Mihi kauana ki a koutou, i whakawhānui tia tēnei kāwanatanga tēnā rā koutou. Me mō te kāhui Māori o te rōpu reipa, he mahi nui kei mui a tātou, hei kaui ai i ngā moi moia, ngā whakaaro, ngā hia hia o te iwi Māori. Nā reira mihi kauana ki a koutou. Me ngā minita o te kāhui matua tēnā rā tātou, o ku hoa... Minita Māori, Pēni Henare, Willie Jackson, Anaya Mahuta, Kiri Tapu Allen, me ka whaitiri, tēnei tōku mihi ki a koutou, he mahi nui hoki kei mui a tātou. Nā reira, ngā āpiha o tēnei whare, tēnā rā koutou mō ngā mahi, ka mahi ngi a koutou i rotu i ngā tau e tōru kei mui a tātou. E mihi kauna ki a koutou, mō era mahi, ka mahi ngi a koutou. Nā reira, Ka nui e nei oku mihi huri rauna i tō tātou whare, e te māngo e te whare, tēnei hau mihi kauna ki a tātou katoa, i rongi te tūmanako, ka mahi tika, tātou ka mahi tātou i rongi te tika, me te pono mo te tō tātou motu whānu o Aotearoa nā reira huri rauna tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Tōrā mai 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 tōr
Mr. Speaker, if I could just break into English for a second, you might have noticed I stepped to the side here to sing that waiata. <clears throat> when I had the privilege of giving the first mihi in the last parliament, um, my mother rang me afterwards and said she had heard me and, and said, um, I said, well, how did it go, Mum? And she said, oh, that was good, son, but next time step away from the microphone because the whole country heard how flat you sang. katoa. <laughs> No, I'm unmuting my own mic <laughs> in order to keep the quality of the, uh, uh, of the sound of the parliament. Um, members, the House will now wait for the summons to attend on Her Excellency the Governor-General. And during that time, the Governor-General has arrived, has proceeded inside because obviously we couldn't, have the, with the wet weather, have the arranged pofuri outside. However, this is Ngāti Ponuki, the Kapahaka group is singing in the Grand Hall. A concha was blown as she moved up the steps, coming onto the first floor. It sounded three times, summoning the three winds of Taferi Matia to assist the fourth wind. Governor to General today is wearing a Tarapohehe or flak shawl that was recently gifted to her. Black Rod, please summon the House of Representatives. And as Black Rod reverses slowly out of the Legislative Council chamber, she has a symbolic Black Rod over her shoulder. The Black Rod was only presented in 1931. Before that, a simple black billiard cue was apparently used for many years. top of the rod is a gold lion rampant, supports a shield bearing the royal cipher of King George V within the garter surmounted by a royal crown. And in the base is set a 1931 gold sovereign. Now that light rod is swapped for something more robust to actually knock on the doors of the House of Representatives. doors bear the dents of the pounding with the black rod. Remove the bar.
proceedings inside the house are being overseen at the moment by the sergeant at arms. Mr. Speaker, Her Excellency, the Governor General, commands the immediate attendance of this honourable house in the council chamber. And the Sergeant at Arms has now placed the mace over his shoulder and is proceeding out behind Black Rod. They've been Sergeant at Arms in the Royal Household since the Middle Ages. In New Zealand, the first Sergeant at Arms was appointed in 1854. And the mace over his shoulder represents the authority of both the Sovereign and the Speaker. Ngāti Ponaki perform MPs are filing out of the House of Representatives and into the Legislative Council Chamber, ready to hear the speech from the throne that will be presented by the Governor-General, who this morning is here by herself. So the mace that was just in vision of those who were watching was presented to the House of Representatives in 1909 from the then Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Sir Joseph Ward and his ministerial colleagues. It's a replica of the mace of the House of Commons and was weighed by Goldsmiths and Silversmiths Company London. It's almost one and a half metres long, weighs about eight kilograms and it's made of sterling silver gilded with 18 karat gold. Ponaki performing Wayata was restored in the mid 1990s. His arched stained glass windows, glass ceiling domes, and heart Rimu panels it has an Australian gum parquet floor. The Legislative Council chamber itself, where the Governor General is awaiting MPs is the room where New Zealand's Upper House, called the Legislative Council, met until January 1951 when the Upper House was abolished. The Council Chamber is a very grand room. It's surrounded on its upper floors by galleries similar to those above the Chamber of the House of Representatives. The room features native wood, a puriri canopy, and Italian marble pillars. The walls are panelled in varnished rimu and a deep red carpet covers the floor. The Council's most important role nowadays is what's happening today, the state opening of Parliament.
speech from the throne has been presented by the Prime Minister, Rang Korowai. E aku hoa i te ara o te whai. Kia kotahi tā tātou takahi i te kō. Ko tōku whiwhi kei tō koutou tou toko mai. Ko tāku ki a koutou, he whakapiki manawa mōku. He horomata rangatira te mahi e rite ai te whiwhinga a te ringa tuku me te ringa kape ake i o ngā painga. He ruru hau, he kai toko i te ora. He kai uru ngi, he kai whakaawe tau matahou. He mea pai i o ti tahi. Nau, nāku, nā tātou. Honourable Members of the House of Representatives, it is my privilege to exercise the prerogative of Her Majesty the Queen and open the 53rd Parliament. In the October election, New Zealanders elected a majority government for the first time under our mixed member proportional electoral system. The government not only enjoys the confidence of a clear majority of members in the House of Representatives, it is also privileged to have the confidence of a majority of New Zealanders who voted in the general election. The Labour government took office when I swore in the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern. New Zealanders voted for stability and certainty at the election. They have placed huge trust and responsibility in the Labour government by providing it with a majority mandate to implement the policies it set out during the campaign, while responding to the issues that will inevitably arise and bringing to bear the same values and strong leadership established in its first term. To add further stability to the New Zealand Government, the Labour Party has agreed to work together with the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand through a cooperation agreement. This agreement commits the Government to working in the best interests of New Zealand and New Zealanders, working to honour Te Tariti o Waitangi and working together on specific policy areas where the Green Party continu can continue to add expertise and where both parties can achieve mutual gains that advance the goals of the Government. The Labour Government takes office at a time of unparalleled international crisis. It faces the greatest public health emergency since the global flu pandemic a century ago. The ensuing economic shock represents the largest global downturn since the Great Depression. The health risk posed by the pandemic is greater now than it was when we first closed our borders. The global economic outlook continues to worsen. New Zealand will not be immune to these deteriorating conditions. In this year of crisis, protecting New Zealand and the lives and livelihoods of New Zealanders has been the urgent and abiding consideration. It remains so. But that does not mark the full extent of what a government can do, and it does not mark the full extent of what this government means to do. Crises do not form an orderly line waiting to be addressed. Three of the country's longest standing and hardest issues demand continued and determined action. Affordable housing and homelessness, child poverty, and the global climate crisis. On each of these areas, there is a need to do more and go further. Problems that are decades in the making are not easily or quickly solved. But this government is committed to relentlessly pursuing progress. The government means to build on the foundations laid in the first term. New Zealand must continue to tackle these issues at gathering scale, at gathering speed, and with gathering effect. The Labour government will have three overarching objectives. To keep New Zealanders safe from COVID-19, to accelerate our economic recovery, to lay the foundations for a better future. The scale and pace of the recovery offers an opportunity to reshape the way things are done in New Zealand, to innovate and improve our position and our economy. New Zealand's success in fighting the virus 
means we are better positioned for recovery than many other countries. Already we have seen employment, export and growth numbers that are better than expected. The programme outlined today seeks to make the most of our head start. Keeping New Zealanders safe from COVID-19. The first objective of the government will be to keep New Zealanders safe from COVID. In keeping New Zealanders safe, we protect jobs, livelihoods and strengthen our economy. A strong health response has given the New Zealand economy the best chance at coming back stronger. The government remains committed to a strategy of elimination, but will always remain open to evolving ways of achieving it. No system is perfect, that is why we look to continually improve. As we learn more about the virus and other countries' experiences, and as new technologies are developed, there will be opportunities to improve our response. Our response has never been static and we will continue to innovate and learn. The government will retain and enhance the multiple lines of defence to keep COVID at bay and stamp it out with minimal disruption to the economy and to our everyday lives. The first layer of defence is our border. With COVID cases increasing around the world in a growing number of countries, the risk of travellers arriving at the border with COVID increases. The government will continue to strengthen border protections. Testing, infection control procedures and professional and quality staffing will remain cornerstones of the response. For those countries where the virus is successfully managed, the government will look for opportunities for freer travel. Planning for quarantine-free travel zones is currently underway with the Cook Islands, Nui and Australia. We will look to continue to advance these opportunities, but with safety as our priority. We will continue to welcome New Zealanders home. We will also create opportunities for businesses to access the skills they need. The government will ensure that up to 10% of the places in our managed isolation facilities are used by people granted exceptions to enter New Zealand to contribute to accelerating our recovery. The government will continue to enhance the next layer of defence. Our contact tracing and testing systems to ensure in the event of cases entering the community, it can quickly circle the virus and stamp it out. This will involve investment in ongoing technical enhancements to the COVID Tracer app and looking for ways to increase the use of technology. We have expanded the surveillance testing program to provide extra protection against pathways for infection. This term we will look for opportunities to take advantage of developments in technology to expand the reach of our early warning system. Finally, the government is working to deliver effective and free vaccines to New Zealanders as soon as they are available and safe to administer. Recent news of the progress in vaccine development is welcome and a bright spot on the horizon. This will be a central focus for the government next year. The government is working hard to secure supply for New Zealand and to design an immunisation programme to support distribution in New Zealand. New Zealand also has an important role in supporting Pacific countries with access to a COVID-19 vaccine and their rollout of their immunisation programmes. New Zealand's obligations to the Pacific are a core part of the vaccine strategy. We are hopeful that 2021 will be the year of the COVID vaccine. Accelerating the recovery. The government's COVID recovery plan is already underway. It will now be accelerated as the plans for recovery set out in Labour's election manifesto are implemented. The New Zealand economy has held up better than expected. Aggressive action to eliminate the virus, strong and early efforts to save jobs and support businesses, and innovative and nimble responses from our businesses have positioned the economy well. 
but the global picture is bleak. The ongoing impact of COVID on the global economy is the most significant risk to our future growth. The virus's spread abroad will have a downstream impact on our exporters and impact economic activity domestically. New Zealand will be cushioned from that slump by the government's five-point economic plan to foster jobs and growth. $42 billion of infrastructure investment to future-proof the economy. Training and job creation opportunities to support workers and businesses. Support for small business to grow and thrive. Programs to bolster our exports and policies that prepare New Zealand for the future by making the most of our competitive advantage in renewable energy and waste reduction. Investing in infrastructure is at the core of the government's economic plan. As we begin this term, we already have a record $42.2 billion on the books for infrastructure investment over the next four years in roads and rail, schools and hospitals, houses and energy generation. Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, will receive $9.6 billion to invest in new roads and public transport projects that reduce congestion and travel times, support businesses, open up new areas for housing and increase choice, including safer options for walking and cycling. $3.8 billion is being spent on education facilities, including building new schools and classrooms for 100,000 students and starting the planned upgrade of around 180 schools right across the country over the next 10 years. $3.6 billion has been committed to health, including new hospital facilities in Dunedin, Christchurch, New Plymouth, Auckland and counties Manukau. Kainga Ora will invest $9.8 billion across the next four years and the government is on track to deliver a total of 18,000 public and transitional homes. The Three Waters Programme will see a $710 million investment to initiate an overhaul of the, of the nation's drinking, waste and stormwater infrastructure. These investments in housing, transport, schools and hospitals will help future-proof our economy as well as create jobs. It also provides a pipeline of work that will provide businesses with confidence and certainty to invest in capacity to undertake these projects. In addition, over 150 smaller community infrastructure projects will roll out over the coming months and across the term. The government will invest in community projects like pools and stadiums, local fire stations and surf clubs, and libraries, art galleries, marae and museums. <coughs> facilities across the country that bring people together to provide support and strengthen communities. Improving our planning system is also a priority. It will create jobs by making it easier to deliver construction projects while protecting our environment and building the right thing in the right place. The current system is too costly, takes too long and has not adequately protected the environment. The government will ensure that New Zealand's resource management system is fit for the future by repealing and replacing the Resource Management Act. The Randerson Review provides a sound platform for the government to advance this work. In the first six months of 2021, the government intends to release an exposure draft of key elements of the first bill. Also vital to the recovery is our investment in trades training and apprenticeships. Education is the greatest enabler in our society and one of the biggest levers we can use to improve the productivity of the economy. In the early stages of our COVID response, the government focused heavily on growing training and apprenticeships. It launched a comprehensive support package for apprentices and their employers assuring job security for existing apprentices 
and creating openings for new ones. Already thousands of New Zealanders have embraced the opportunity to take up a trade and train for free. These New Zealanders are acquiring new skills and exciting prospects, and at the same time addressing the need to build the workforce that will be required to carry the vast workload of the coming infrastructure projects. The government will also complete the reform of the vocational education system. As the country rebuilds and more people are looking to retrain, it's now more important than ever that we have a vocational education system that's responsive to the needs of industry and learners. The government recognises the need to welcome skilled people from overseas to help support New Zealand's economy and will work alongside industry to help provide for that, but it will, as a priority and as a starting point, seek to develop New Zealand workforces to meet those skills needed here at home. With many New Zealanders looking for work, we need to do all we can to fill existing job opportunities. While unemployment is lower than expected, the economic fallout has had an impact. The government will remain focused on creating opportunities for people to get back to work. History shows that significant economic events have a disproportionate impact on women, Māori and Pacific communities. And our focus will ensure that our recovery responds to that. The government will reinstate the, tra reinstate the training incentive allowance to assist sole parents, disabled people and their carers with the costs of getting a degree level tertiary qualification. It will con continue the successful mana in mahi and heiputa marangatahi programs which are providing skills and qualifications to unemployed young people. It will also continue to roll out Tupu Aotearoa's expansion across the regions and provide wraparound support for Pacific communities to secure sustainable employment and educational pathways for Pacific people of all ages. The government will lift abatement thresholds to ensure that people are not punished by transitioning from a benefit to paid work. It will also support those at risk of long-term unemployment through funding up to an additional 40,000 New Zealanders into work through the Flexi Wage Programme. As well as creating jobs, the government will remain focused on growing the incomes and wages of New Zealanders, especially those earning the least. It will increase the minimum wage to $20 per hour next year, extend living wage guarantees to cleaning, catering and security guards who the public service pays through contractors, implement fair pay agreements to set minimum standards for pay and conditions, and extend sick leave provisions. The government will leverage our successful COVID response to position New Zealand globally as a safe and secure place to trade with, to invest in, and eventually to visit again. The government will pursue high quality and comprehensive trade agreements that diversify our trade relationships. It will continue to open new opportunities, including through trade deals with the EU and the UK, and the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability and by expanding the CPTPP and the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement. The government will continue to progress our trade relationship with the United States, including into new areas such as digital and green technology. An important milestone has been accomplished with the conclusion of the China FTA upgrade, which will provide access into new services markets in China, including e-commerce. The New Zealand Government will continue to support New Zealanders doing New Zealand exporters doing business with China. The Pacific Regional Trade and Development Agreement PACER Plus will enter into force in December this year. The agreement positions Pacific countries to better engage in international trade. It will make trade easier, will grow jobs, boost sustainable economic growth, and contribute to a safer and more prosperous Pacific. In the Indo-Pacific region, the government will work to implement the signing of RCEP 
and through chairing APEC in 2021, New Zealand will lead on the world stage to drive initiatives for strong regional economic recovery. The government will work with industry through industry transformation plans to support the transition and grow high value export firms. It will continue its investment in innovation, including through the research and development tax credit program. It will work to implement the primary sector roadmap fit for a better world to accelerate the productivity, sustainability and inclusiveness of the primary sector. It will work to support our tourism sector in its transition to a sustainable, low-carbon, high-skill and high-wage industry. It will expand the Innovative Partnerships Programme and New Zealand Trade and Enterprises dedicated international investment attraction team to attract companies to invest and establish in New Zealand. Small businesses are at the heart of New Zealand's economy and the recovery. The government will continue to support small businesses with practical support. That will include tackling barriers to innovation and growth as identified by the Small Business Council's Small Business Strategy. The government has already extended the Small Business Cash Flow Scheme for a further three years and extended the interest-free period for another year and will investigate permanent financing for smaller businesses. The government will regulate merchant service fees to reduce costs on retailers and will support small businesses to digitise through digital training or short courses as part of a new digital training programme. The new Minister for the Digital Economy and Communications will work with the technology sector, including through the Digital Technologies Industry Transformation Plan, to help speed growth in jobs and incomes in that important sector. New Zealand's COVID-19 recovery provides an opportunity to reshape our economy and prepare for the future through investment in energy and waste projects. The government is committed to the shift away from fossil fuels in order to build a new low carbon future. It is a shift that will create jobs, improve the environment and enhance New Zealand's global brand which our exporters trade on. This term, the government will lay the foundation for the electrification of New Zealand's economy by bringing forward our 100% renewable electricity target to 2030, prohibit the building of new thermal baseload electricity, investigate dry year storage options such as pumped hydro, and invest in emerging technologies like green hydrogen. It will remove barriers to renewable energy generation through a national policy statement and also investigate regulatory or market barriers to the uptake of solar microgeneration on residential and commercial buildings. The government will invest in electrifying and decarbonising industrial and process heat, including by preventing the installation of new low and medium temperature coal-fired boilers and supporting businesses to replace fossil fuels in industrial heat processes by connecting to the grid. The government will implement the recommendations of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor by phasing out hard to recycle single use plastic items and supporting the development of alternatives through a plastics innovation fund. It will also invest in waste infrastructure and projects to enable more efficient recycling and work with industries to establish regulated product stewardship schemes for priority products. This economic plan is underpinned by continued responsible management of the government books. As a consequence of the wider economic outlook and fiscal constraints, it is more important than ever to ensure a balanced approach. This requires investing in our priorities while ensuring that all government spending decisions are made with particular consideration for the sustainability of the Crown's long-term fiscal position. The government will continue to ensure vital public services are supported while keeping a lid on debt. Investments to accelerate recovery will be prioritised. Ensuring our health and education systems continue to be supported 
will also be a priority. This will include implementing the government response to the Health and Disability System Review, the efforts of many hard-working and committed health professionals and the health of New Zealanders are hampered by a system that needs fundamental reform. Initial decisions on policy will be taken in 2021. Laying the foundations for a better future. The government has marked out the need and importance of taking a broader view of success. Wellbeing will continue to be a priority for government this term with a focus on reducing child poverty, tackling climate change and addressing housing. New Zealand's response to COVID would be insufficient if it were to simply return us to the way we were before the virus. Recovering and rebuilding entails determined and connected action by government. That action can and will be used to reshape the economy to be more productive, more sustainable and more equitable. Over the next term, it will place a particular focus on sustainability and pursuing carbon neutrality. The government will respond to the first set of climate budgets recommended by the Climate Commission, which will set the total emissions permitted for the next 15 years. The government will take steps to decarbonise the transport fleet. It will introduce vehicle emission standards for imported vehicles and incentivise and accelerate the uptake of electric and other low emission vehicles, including by increasing the low emission vehicles contestable fund. In line with the direction set out in the latest government policy statement, it will prioritise investment in public transport, walking and cycling, so users have a more accessible, affordable and reliable service and implement region-specific plans to increase the number of people using public transport and walking and cycling. Supporting the use of public transport is a key element to reducing New Zealand's transport emissions. Given the importance of public transport to New Zealand's future transport system, it will require only zero emissions buses to be purchased by 2025 and aim to decarbonise the public transport fleet, bus fleet by 2035. New Zealand's farmers and growers are creative, innovative and constantly looking to improve their practices. They are taking steps to improve freshwater quality, protect biodiversity and reduce emissions. This will create real value for our exports and is a core part of our New Zealand brand. The government will bolster these efforts through increased investment in world-leading research that helps us reduce emissions and will support farmers to use integrated farm plans to simplify processes, reduce compliance costs and meet reporting requirements in a coherent way. The economic impact of COVID will have a disproportionate effect on those least equipped to deal with it. That will require a continued focus and determination in reducing inequality and addressing child poverty. Progress has been made, but there remains much to do. The government will work, continue the work from last term that has already seen improvements to the weekly income of around 85,000 sole parents by an average of $100 a week. The government will continue the overhaul of the welfare system building on the changes already made, including the indexing of benefits to increases in the average wage. It will extend the free and healthy lunch program to cover 200,000 students and will add 20 more mobile dental clinics to improve access for children and young people to free oral health care. It will roll out mental health support to all primary and intermediate school age students and continue to roll out nurses in secondary schools. It will continue to tackle the prevalence of rheumatic fever by expanding the Healthy Homes Initiative to every DHB around the country to ensure more homes are warm, dry and safe. A focus on housing will be a priority for this government. Earlier in the year, house prices were predicted to fall. Instead, they have increased. Globally, low interest rates are having a similar effect. 
and the situation has rapidly evolved. While it's pleasing to see that efforts to stimulate the economy and support jobs and growth in the wider economy have been effective, the perverse impact on housing affordability will require the government to continue its focus on this issue. The government has set out the parameters of what it is prepared to consider during the collection campaign. This will not change. But there is room to do more to support both the supply and demand side of housing to see outcomes that are more productive and fair. The government will review its housing settings with a view to implementing policies that improve access to the housing market for first home buyers. The government will continue to focus on homelessness and implementing the Homelessness Action Plan. The government will review and enhance the Tenancy Tribunal, Tenancy Services Compliance and Investigations Team, regulate property managers and increase funding to proactively monitor compliance with the Healthy Homes Standards. In each of these areas, climate, child poverty and housing, the government will be guided by its values and by its commitment to the well-being of people, looking beyond GDP to find our measure of success. As part of this focus on well-being and creating a fairer New Zealand, we will continue to strengthen social inclusion in New Zealand. This is about supporting our diversity and creating a New Zealand where all people feel safe, have equal access to opportunities and do not experience discrimination. This is important as we prepare to receive and respond to the report of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the terrorist attack on the Christchurch mosques on February 15 March 2019. Well-being might not be as readily reckoned as GDP, but that does not mean it cannot be me measured and tracked. Imbalances and deprivation can be recognised and remedied, and this government is determined to do so. Significant levels of government investment in a time of crisis can be a powerful tool for change, and it's a tool that's being used. The way we choose to govern is also a tool for change. Māori Crown Relations. The Government will strengthen the Māori Crown relationship to ensure that the Crown can go, grow to be a better treaty partner and work in true partnership with Māori. It will continue to work to settle historic Treaty of Waitangi claims. It recognises the importance of te reo Māori as a taonga and the responsibility it has to protect it. Te ao Māori plays a large part, not just in defining who we are as a nation, but in setting us apart from the rest of the world. As such, the government will make Matariki a public holiday, creating a holiday that distinctly recognises and celebrates Te ao Māori. The government will ensure Oranga Tamariki partners with iwi, hapu and Māori organisations to find appropriate solutions for children in need and will strengthen Māori housing outcomes through collaborative partnerships, home ownership models and papakainga provision. It will support whānau Māori enterprise and opportunities through a progressive procurement policy. It will continue to invest in whānau ora and support other agencies to implement the whānau ora model to get better outcomes for Māori continue whānau-centred pathways to break the cycle of Māori re-offending, work with other Māori organisations like Te Kōhanga Reo and look at ways we can expand the whānau ora model into communities. A government for all New Zealanders. New Zealand has entrusted the government with the responsibility of bringing the country through a crisis. Nothing in the programme set out today will come easily. But our opportunities and potential greatly outweigh our problems. In this pandemic, we have shown our willingness and capacity to do what must be done. We have more freedoms, are a more open economy, and have saved more lives than nearly every other country we normally compare ourselves to. We can rightfully be proud of our success to date 
as a nation, as a team. But we cannot afford to be complacent nor stand still. We must keep going. It is the government's aim to achieve change alongside consensus. That is why it is committed to being a government that will govern for all New Zealanders. That does not mean that it can or will represent the views of every New Zealander all of the time. But it does mean it will have a focus on the things that matter most. It means it will be listening to New Zealanders, being pragmatic, doing the things it said it would do, and focusing on lasting change. We can recover and we will recover, but that is not enough. We can be better than we were. The government's mission is to make it so. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. And that's a speech from the throne delivered by Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Dame Patsy Reddy, who's New Zealand's 21st Governor-General and the third woman to hold that office. Black Rod and the Herald are now moving into position in front of the Governor-General, who's rising from the throne. speech has now been handed to the Speaker. It was given to the Governor-General by the Prime Minister and outlines the Government's agenda for the current parliamentary term. to accompany the Governor-General as she departs the Legislative Council Chamber through the Grand Hall on her way out of the Parliamentary Precinct. During her time here, the Governor-General's flag will have flown. It's an oblong blue flag in the centre a New Zealand coat of arms and it's surmounted by a royal crown, St Edward's crown. This new flag design was announced in 2008 and this is the third occasion that it's been flown at the state opening of Parliament. leading the group out of the Grand Hall on an area called by press gallery reporters the tiles where they traditionally try to speak to MPs and ministers before they enter the house. Continue as Waiata. The judiciary are making their way out, and now the sergeant at arms has shouldered the mace and is now leading MPs back to the house. The Governor General would normally be farewelled by a royal salute from the Royal Tri Service Guards of Honour with a band playing God Save the Queen, but Unfortunately, all of those outside ceremonies have been cancelled due to the weather in Wellington today. Unfortunately, consistent rain put an end to that. The speaker is following behind the sergeant at arms with a mace over his shoulder. They're entering the House of Representatives, the clerks of the House and the Prime Minister. Once all the members have returned to the House, the speech read by the Governor-General will be tabled. Members are able to respond to the Governor-General's speech in a, in a debate known as the Address and Reply Debate. 
This is the first major debate in Parliament and is a wide-ranging debate on matters such as the government's economic and foreign policy and other matters that were outlined in the speech from the throne. The address and reply debate is not only an opportunity to discuss right. the agenda as outlined. For those watching, we can just see the embroidery on the throne from which the Governor-General delivered her speech. It was made for the state opening of Parliament by Her Majesty the Queen in January 1954. That was the first occasion a reigning sovereign personally opened a session of the New Zealand Parliament. And today's state opening is, of course, the 53rd such occasion. Many of the MPs returning to the House of Representatives, of course, are new to their jobs. And many are recording it on their phones as they go. While Ngāti Ponaki, the oldest kapahaka group in New Zealand, continues with Waiata. At the end of address and reply debate, the House generally agrees to address, send address to the Governor-General thanking her for their speech. After Her Excellency the Governor-General made a speech to the House in the Legislative Council Chamber today, she handed me a copy of the text of the speech and I now lay this on the table of the House. Speaker. The Honourable Chris Hipkins. Mr Speaker, next week will be the first full sitting week of the 53rd Parliament. The first oral questions of the Parliament will be answered by Ministers on Tuesday. The address and reply debate will continue and will feature 14 further maiden statements. After oral questions on Tuesday, the House will debate a motion on the climate emergency. That evening, the House will go into urgency to pass bills on tax changes and other matters. Other legislation to be considered next week will include the first readings of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand Bill and the Social Security Financial Assistance for Caregivers Amendment Bill.